and occupy today as the traditional home of the Spokane tribe of Indians. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. On behalf of the Lands Council, welcome. I am your moderator today. My name is Narmana Shirazi, and I work as the Climate Justice Program Director for the Lands Council in Spokane. Uh, you will hear me refer to us as TLC for short. I'm joined by Shar Lichti, a dear friend and ally, also the Development Director with Peace and Justice Action League of Spokane, who, along with Justice Brandt, our Volunteer Coordinator, and Lindsay Box, our Communications Director at the Lands Council, are working hard behind the scenes to bring you this webinar, How Climate Change is Driving Policy in Washington, and Are We Resilient Enough? So we hope to have this conversation. Our mission at the Lands Council is to preserve the forests, water, and wildlife of the inland Northwest region. By discussing the policy changes we need to make in the face of climate change, we hope to bring informed decisions and power of issues, directions to possible solutions, and the changes we need to make in our daily living, and how we approach these um, issues to ensure our state is thriving in every aspect in the face of climate change. Resiliency is one of the most important aspects of survival, as we have already seen from the recent post pandemic. We were not prepared for anything of this magnitude and how it affected our population, economy, supply chains worldwide. We are still coming to grips with the subsequent toll on our habits, how we interact with our loved ones, how we work, the changes in our environment, and the, literally the culture that we are living in today. The United States economy faces significant challenges as we navigate increased uncertainty due to tightening global financial conditions, persistent inflation, lower global growth rates, and increased social unrest. These conditions make policymaking more difficult as leaders must focus on macroeconomic stability and social cohesion. According to the World Bank, low growth rates are expected in 2023 and 2024, making the need for structural factors to be addressed, such as social and infrastructural investments, innovation in education, and policy reforms that address climate change. However, the question of how to jumpstart an economic recovery process that allows for continued dynamic, inclusive, and sustainable growth looms large. Today, we are joined by some of Washington's foremost leaders, two our elected officials and two our appointed officials, as well as our executive director at the Lands Council. We are asking for their viewpoints on the economic outlook and opportunities to rebuild our region so we can become a more equitable and, and inclusive society in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and can successfully offset the effects of climate change in the next few years. I would like to introduce our panelists today. We are exceedingly lucky in the caliber of our leadership here in Washington State. And today I have the pleasure of introducing some of them. Lisa J. Brown, PhD, is an economist and educator serving as the director of the Washington State Department of Commerce. She served in both houses of Washington State Legislature for 20 years, including eight years as the first Democratic female majority leader of the Washington State Senate. Representing District 3 from 2013 to 2017, Dr. Brown was Chancellor of Washington State University, Spokane, where she led the Health Science Campus. She currently resides in Spokane. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Brown. Omer A. Shah, MD, MPH, was appointed Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington by Governor Jay Inslee in December 2020. Dr. Shah earned his BA in philosophy from Vanderbilt University, his MD from the University of Toledo Health Science Center, and completed an internal medicine residency, primary care slash general medicine fellowship and MPH in management at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. He also completed a global health policy internship at World Health Organization headquarters in Switzerland. Over his career, Dr. Shah has been a clinician innovator, educator, and leader in health. He has been a champion for underserved communities at the intersection of health and healthcare, 
while charting a fresh course in health by centering on the cornerstone values of equity, innovation, and engagement. Thank you for being here, Dr. Shah. Thank you. Mike Pellicciotti, JD, was elected Washington's 24th state treasurer in 2020. As Washington's chief financial officer, Mike is dedicated to financial transparency, protecting Washington's um, financial health and advancing policies that best serve our state's working families and retirees. Before becoming treasurer, he served two terms in the Washington House of Representatives, where he served on House fiscal committees, including the Capital Budget Committee in the legislature. Mike fought for some equitable and open government passing laws to get dark money out of politics and requiring that the legislature provide its public records. Before representing the 30th legislature, uh, the 30th legislative district of South King and North Pierce counties, Mike was an assistant attorney general who managed a state unit that combated economic fraud in Washington. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration and he recovered his, uh, sorry, he received his master's in rural development as a United States Fulbright scholar where he studied economic development. His Juris Doctor is from Gonzaga University and is a lifelong fan of Gonzaga basketball. So glad you could join us today, Treasurer Pellicciotti. Thank you. Great. It's great to be with you, Nagmana. Thank you. Commission Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, leads Washington State's wildlife fighting force and manages nearly 6 million acres of public lands from coastal waters and aquatic reserves to working for forests and farms, commercial development, and unparalleled recreation areas. Commissioner Franz is committed to ensuring our public lands are healthy and productive, both today and for future generations. She has led efforts to protect our communities and environment from the impact of a changing climate, increased development, and wildfire. Franz has ha also prioritized supporting local communities, both urban and rural, the lands she manages sustainably generates hundreds of thousands of dollars for schools and public services, like libraries and hospitals. And she has allocated millions of dollars to spark economic opportunities in struggling rural communities. She knows that our working lands and the communities that depend on them for family wage jobs are integral to our success as a state, and she is investing in their success. Always a pleasure to see you, Commissioner Franz. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. After studying comparative ecology and conservation in Ecuador, Amanda Parrish earned a degree in environmental studies from the University of San Francisco, California. She has worked in watershed restoration at the Lands Council since 2009, working in forestry with the Coeur d'Alene tribe in Northern Idaho before that. In 2021, she became the Lands Council's new executive director and maintains that equity and collective action must drive our search for solutions to the problems that come with a challenge with a changing climate. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. We will now start with our questions. And I apologize for being the sole talking head. It just turned out to be the way it is. We're a small nonprofit, only eight people, so we do the best we can. All right. So um, my first question, or rather, let me explain the format, what we're doing. So each panelist, we asked three questions related to their field, which have been formulated by either combining several questions we received via email or during discussion out in the community. And they have and they will have and, and the panelists will have uh, up to three minutes to answer questions one and two. The third question will be a general question for all participants to contribute to the dis discussion for up to about 15 minutes. Before we transition to the last part of this, this, this discussion, where we will randomly select two or three questions from the audience, attendees are invited to ask the question, questions via the question and answer function. The first question is for D Director Brown. So bear with me, Lisa, this is going to give a lot of background and then I will ask my question. So if people with different values have different reasons for concern about climate change or different anxieties regarding climate policy, this may impede policymakers' ability to sustain the cross-party coalition that will be necessary to make that difficult adjustments. 
In the worst case scenario, disagreements over the reasons for action and types of action could cause policymakers to pursue divisive policies and messaging, which could draw climate policy into the fractious political culture wars. With that, each side could re retreat to its extremes, with the left pursuing an anti-growth, anti-markets approach to green policies and the right potentially dropping the ambition to decarbonize altogether. This would be a death knell to the confidence that net zero transition requires. How will you ensure policies that will keep our economy balanced and thriving? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you all for being here. And to the Lands Council in particular, I think you have been in Spokane about as many decades as I have been here and have been a really important organization in our community and in Eastern Washington. So thank you very much and Northern Idaho. Um, so I think the gist of that question, Nagmana, is what if political instability disrupts good policy? And um, I think I will just say that's already happened. That is happening. I think the evidence of it is pretty clear. Political division and instability has disrupted the U.S.'s participation on the nat and the international stage in in pursuing a climate goals and and certainly we cannot take anything for granted in Washington State in my own congressional race a few years ago I want all the urban areas I lost all the rural areas this is a there is a real divide in our country and that is a that does lead to uh, instability in policy I do believe we have pretty good policy framework in place in Washington state. I think really leading the country in some ways in terms of our policy framework. We have good greenhouse gas emission targets. We are looking not only at our energy transformation, but at our, our built environment. We are working on um, resilience. Um, the commissioner I'm sure will talk about how healthy forests and land fits into that picture. So there's a lot to be proud of that we could delve into on the policy framework. It can be disrupted both by economic instability, which we're currently facing and by this political instability. And so the question of how we deal with both of those, I think is really important. Uh, and in some ways they intersect because it means that people get left out of opportunity and the kinds of things that I think we all have in common that we want for ourselves and our families. And so I think focusing on um, that rural urban divide and how we are going to really grapple with the transition that we, all, that we see on the policy framework, how that affects people who live in rural areas, how we can demonstrate that we value those communities and uh, don't want them to disappear but want them to thrive with new opportunities and how we look at equity within our urban areas, people that are shut out of housing markets, the, the white black home ownership disparity in Washington state is sadly um, among the worst in the country. So by dealing with inclusiveness and belonging and building an economy that works for all as we transition very intentionally, uh, I think we will get at the roots of some of the political instability, and that will give us some flexibility as we move towards meeting our clean energy targets as well. I timed myself, so there. <laughs> That's yeah. it for this one. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is for Mike Pellicciotti. Uh, Treasurer Pellicciotti, as we have seen in the power sector, confident government leadership and global co cooperation can lead to huge investment and massive innovation. Bringing the cost of renewable technology down faster and further than anyone thought possible, leading to governments setting even more ambitious targets. These are the conditions we need to strive for across the net zero Treasurer's office doing to ensure an ESG model for our state. And just for we, I know we look for time for you to be doing this for in four minutes. And so I took a minute away from your next question, your next answer. So you have four minutes to answer. 
<laughs> okay, well, I appreciate it. I, 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 I think it was a little garbled on my end, but I think I caught the, the question. And, and, you know, I guess what I would say is, um, you know, the, the future is going to be in, in green energy. I, I'm just a believer in that. And, you know, so much of the work that we do in the state treasurer's office um, is with a long-term outlook on everything that we do. So, you know, while, you know, so, you know some uh, elected politicians, and I can say this as a former legislator, might be thinking in a one or two year horizon with policies, you know, in our office, we're always thinking 10, 20, 30, 40 years out in everything that we do and in everything we consider. And, you know, one of my core beliefs and, and views is that, you know, like I said, that, you know, we, we are moving toward, uh, you know, a green, green energy future. And that means investing uh, accordingly, you know, one of the things that I did when I came in as state treasurer last year is in the thirty billion dollars that that I'm responsible for investing is, I did um, an, an environmental, social, and governance um, review on all of our investments, and you know, so for every aspect of the thirty billion dollars that I'm responsible for investing, making sure that we're thinking and making sure that there's an environmental review, that there's a social review, and that there's a governance review related to all aspects of those investments. I think that's critical. It's because we as long-term investors, um, as institutional investors, need to be thinking long-term related to those investments. Um, you know, I, I don't speak for the State Investment Board, but the State Investment Board obviously is, you know, which invests our state pensions, um, also, you know, has made sure that there is an appropriate um, view that there is a need for a long-term uh, consideration as institutional investors, meaning that when we invest, uh, when the state investment board invests in companies, it's not for short looking for short term profits. It's in a long term view that that company still needs to be in existence 20, 30, 40 years from now. And that means making sure that those companies are being responsible in uh, thinking about their long term existence. And that means making sure that they're adapting to, to climate changes, making sure that they're thinking about what is good from a governance standpoint in terms of the structure and making sure that as institutional investors, um, we're holding them accountable to make sure they're meeting those expectations uh, that we have, which often are quite unique from the expectations that a short-term investor might have. And so I think we play a very important role in making sure we're protecting those longer-term investments. That is part, I feel very much to my core, that is part of our fiduciary responsibility of making sure that we're meeting um, our expectations as investors. Um, as to that long-term outlook. Um, why is that important uh, is because that is not what is happening right now nationally. Um, we are um, under incredible pressure and we meaning the, the, the world, um, but, but we also obviously meaning uh, as state treasurers around the country of making sure that we are uh, adapting here in, in, in our individual states to what we view that fiduciary responsibility to be and be thinking long-term. There are state treasurers right now, and by state treasurer, I mean uh, almost a majority of state treasurers now that are conservative state treasurers that are taking an opposite view where they are specifically um, stopping any investment in any type of um, uh, investment portfolio that is actually even recognizing uh, climate change as existing. I wanna say that again, because it's, it's, as, it's as nuts and as crazy as you think that it is. There is a movement underway nationally that's being led uh, by a, a range of kind of conservative efforts, ALEC, which is a kind of conservative uh, legislative group, as well as being led by Governor DeSantis, Governor Abbott in Texas, and others who are looking to uh, work with their state treasurers to remove any type of investment from those type of long-term uh, investments that are looking at these environmental, social, or good governance aspects. Um, it, 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 is, it is reversed from anything that makes sense. It is contrary to their fiduciary responsibilities. It is absolutely the type of thing we need to be standing up and uh, speaking out against. It's something that I can assure you here in the state of Washington, as long as I'm your state treasurer, that will not happen here with our investments here in the state of Washington. But I, I want to highlight this, especially for those who are following this online, um, how critical this issue is right now. And that we're at this forefront of having this debate. And the challenge is, is that there is an actually, there is a cost now. There is a cost for these um, uh, state treasurers uh, for taking this route, this, this conservative route of not investing in those things that are uh, recognizing the reality of a green energy future. And um, that is costing millions of dollars to um, the pensioners in those states who are left holding the bag for these increased costs through their bad investments. Um, and removing from this this role. So I want to I, I appreciate the question just largely related to environmental social and governance issues, also known as ESG. 
um, on how well, critical it is that there's an awareness on it. So that was four minutes, actually a little bit over. So uh, maybe maybe we can talk about it in the discussion aspect of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next question is for uh, Commissioner Franz. Carbon offsets are ballooning in voluntary and compliance markets, threatening to undermine global climate goals by propping up fossil fuels and unsustainable farming practices while did I lose you? No, we're you're here back. I'm here, but you're back. You you disappeared or you went robotic. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm here. Shall I repeat the question then? Uh sure. Yes, okay. Carbon offsets are ballooning in voluntary and compliance markets threatening to undermine global climate goals by propping up fossil fuels and unsustainable farming practices while harming vulnerable communities. What would you suggest we do to keep entities honest, keep working on goals and continue working to reduce emissions to get to net zero? So thank you for that question. It's great to be here. I mean, I first believe that the state should be a model for all in the work we do around setting climate goals in, a, in the context of actually keeping entities honest. So at the Department of Natural Resources, we are actually implementing a blueprint that unites us behind both an offensive and defensive strategies to address climate change, setting very significant goals and then leading the way on these carbon offsets. I'm a big believer as the land manager for this state, we must increase carbon sequestration in our forest carbon sinks from our forested area to our built environment while simultaneously defending against wildfire and forest conversion that are impacting our climate. So we specifically have a three-part strategy. First, we are working tirelessly to improve the health of all of our forests. We all know the threat wildfire poses to our forests. It would spend the second largest greenhouse gas emissions uh, in Washington state. And unfortunately, we have over 2.7 million acres of forest just in eastern Washington that are dead and dying. We're now seeing increasing die-up of our forests in the west side of the state. We have been working tirelessly to develop and now implement a 20-year goal to restore the health of 1.25 million acres of forest so we can restore the natural wildfire resistance and resilience of these forests. We believe we have to do the same thing now on the west side as we've seen increasing fires. Unfortunately, we're already well ahead to our goal. We will have treated almost 500,000 acres of forest by the end of this year on both federal, state, tribal, and private lands. In addition to that, we also must take steps to actually conserve some of our highest value forests. And um, just this year, we've announced the first ever in the nation uh, carbon project on our state lands where we will be um, setting aside 10,000 acres to be uh, sold into the carbon markets. The reality of that is in just the next 10 years, this will offset the emissions of 2 billion miles driven by gas powered vehicles. One of the exciting parts is what makes our carbon project different than other states is that we have actually guaranteed the additionality. That is, we're ensuring that carbon captured by these forests is over the baseline that would normally be captured by nature. And because these forests were slated to be cut down as a timber sale, because they are such high value um, in sort of the context of how much carbon is stored and their ecological value, we've ensured that, that we will continue to capture carbon and give our project the additionality that buyers on the markets are looking for, therefore setting the standard. In addition to that, our second part of our strategy is actually protecting and expanding our forest land and farmland. We know that our forests in Washington state are some of the highest carbon storage in the world, but they are facing immense threats, not just from wildfire and disease, but actually from development. For the first time, forests cover less than 50% of our state, and we are the evergreen state. If we continue on this trend, we expect to lose an additional 600,000 acres over just the next two decades. In order to reverse this trend, we've set an ambitious goal to reforest 1 million acres of Forest. These are areas that have been burned before where they were harvested on private land and weren't reforested. Um, we're also setting a goal to conserve 1 million acres of forest from conversion of private lands. 
Um, we have already taken significant steps, but we have a long ways to go, especially as we see more and more people who can now work and live anywhere because of COVID. Zoom has made the ability to do that, but it also means more and more people are moving into our forests. The last piece is we must be looking at how we promote the use of sustainable local source forest products. The truth is wood is our most renewable, environmentally sustainable building material, especially when compared to concrete and steel. It also actually stores carbon. So we have the ability to not only help protect the environment by building with wood, but also addressing our largest housing crisis that we face in our state. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer. So next question, I was going to ask you a follow-up question, but I think you got it already. So um, Dr. Shah, um, climate change is causing changes to our harvesting season for many crops. For example, this year, our cherry harvest was delayed and cherries were harvested later than in previous years. What health policies will the Department of Health promote to ensure that our farm workers are protected from our changing climate, whether it's high temperatures or bitter cold? Yeah, first of all, thank you, Nagma, for having me. And also, it's great to be a part of this panel with Lisa and, and Mike and Hillary and, and just the opportunity to, to really, again, uh, uh, Amanda, uh, just everybody, just really the, the opportunity to really describe what the Department of Health is doing. So one quick thing I'm going to just do, first of all, is right here. I don't know if you can see this. I've got my my virtual, so it's not coming on. Let me try to get it a little bit closer. It's not working. I'm gonna have to get, get you can't see it, but no. I, I hid myself. How's that? Um, it is our transformational plan and I'm gonna uh, do our best to try to get our transformational plan in the chat somehow. So you all have an opportunity to see it. As you can see behind me, I've got a virtual background with Mount Rainier, Mount Tahoma here. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, from, uh, not originally from, but I, I spent the last two decades in Texas and coming to Washington in the middle of the pandemic has been a challenging uh, time. I arrived, uh, governor asked me to be the secretary of health. Uh, I, I believe I started four or five days after vaccines arrived in our state and it's been a whirlwind. But one of the things about our transformation plan, which we just released uh, several weeks ago. So please go to our website uh, to, to look at that plan. It has five pillars. And um, in addition to health and wellness and health systems, workforce transformation, emergency response, resilience, and global and one health, we're the first state health agency in the nation to have global and one health as one of its pillars. But there is the fifth one, which is environmental health, which is a call out to the natural environment, the built environment, and the social environment. We believe that all three of those are critical to the work that we do and climate impact. Climate change is absolutely critical, as you heard from my colleagues. So I think one of the biggest issues Issues when you hear about you know cherry season and and something that's changing and how do we protect our workers and how do we protect our 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 people and and ultimately our environment we have to be thinking about the policies that really go into that and so what we are committed to doing at the Department of Health is one and I wish I could have shown it to you that uh, transformational plan to really describe what it is that we how we see the world and what are the commitments that we have to Washingtonians for advancing health and and protecting and um, protecting our environment and preventing further um, illness and disease. So from from the from the worker standpoint, we're absolutely now taking those rules and those policies that we've had previously and reevaluating those in the context of climate change. So whether it's you know related to smoke or airborne illness or or heat or or even emergencies, relooking at all of that because we know that we have learned so much from this pandemic. And the reason we call this not a strategic plan but a transformational plan is that we can be transactional in our approach uh, after this. This pandemic, which isn't quite over yet, as we all know, is that we can be transactional, one and done, as Americans usually do. We go to the next shiny object or the next headline, or we can be transformational. And that's what we have chosen to do as Department of Health. So please go to our plan. There's a lot that's that's in there. And really, it recognizes the importance of climate and health and the broad look at how we approach environmental health in our everyday interactions. Thank you so much. So my next question is for Amanda. Um, uh, even though two years of a global pandemic, the Ro Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, the unusual and the ensuing cost of living crisis, voter concern about climate change 
is at its highest ever levels and shows no signs of abating. Despite the difficult conditions posted by the current energy crisis, there also appears to be a broad and resilient political consensus around net zero um, as a target. What is your opinion on this issue as someone representing the Lands Council in this community? Thank you, um, Nagmana, and, and thank you so much for, for putting this panel together. Um, I first want to define net zero for um, for our participants, what we're talking about there. So, um, you know, net zero is a combination of emissions reductions of carbon dioxide and other um, greenhouse gas equivalent reductions along with um, carbon offsetting. And so, and of course, carbon offsetting is still a form of reduction. It's a reduction somewhere to offset um, use somewhere else. So we know we know that voter concern around climate change is, is at an all-time high. Um, in the recent election, we just saw it was the first time that a lot of Gen Z folks were able to vote and Gen Z came out. And we know that Gen Z really cares about climate change. It's their future. Um, and, and these policies will really affect their quality of lives in the future. Um, we know that Spokane also really cares about climate change. There was a survey done of businesses in Spokane um, that have 50 or more employees, and they were asked, you know, what are your what are your top concerns? And the number one concern was climate change, um, which is why the Lands Council started this climate justice program. Um, is so that people in our community, we know that the concern is there, and people want to know what they can do on an individual level. Um, and so back to net zero. Um, these these emissions reductions, you know, even with um, carbon offsets, the emission reductions that we will have to see will be so vast and felt across um, so many aspects of our lives. And so I think it's important that we start by targeting, you know, the biggest pieces of the pie. And so Washington State is a leader um, in the world in that already. So the, the State Building Code Commission just recently passed um, some standards that really lead the way for our commercial and our residential buildings to transition away from fossil fuels and become electrified because that would reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, how do we roll out that implementation in an equitable way? Like how, how do we um, ensure that homeowners that have you know gas heating can get an electric heat pump? That's maybe where our partners like the Department of Commerce can come in with micro loans or micro grants for, um, you know, trans, um, you know, tr transmitting something. Um, we also know on an individual level, I think I'll just end by saying the most important thing that we can do as individuals is, is vote, right? And so, and many of these decisions are made by elected and appointed officials. And some, one of the greatest things that you can do is, is ask candidates and your representatives what their climate platforms are like we're doing today. So I'm so, I'm so happy that we're joined by um, officials that, that value climate change and resilience. Thank you so much, Amanda. So my next, this is going to be our next uh, second round of questions. It's for, first question is for Lisa Brown, uh, for or Director Brown. Uh, successful climate action relies on the ability to create confidence. Confidence to invest, confidence to innovate, and con confidence to act are the essential components of a market-driven transition. And confidence, in turn, requires certainty and stability. The higher the risk of division over net zero, the higher the costs of transition will be. From the cost of the capital required to build a new wind farm or nuclear plant to the speed and scale of innovation in new electric vehicles and heating technologies to the consumer demand for greener products that underpin economies of scale and bring down prices. What is your priority on policy keeping this in view? Sorry, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, so the market uh, mechanisms, in my opinion, also need to be complemented with the right public investments and oversight. And I'll give you an example of how I think we're doing this right now. 
We've created a Pacific Northwest Hydrogen Association. I'm chairing it. My counterpart in the Department of Energy in Oregon, Janine Benner, is the vice chair. And we are going for a major federal commitment to have our region designated as a clean hydrogen hub. And as we put together that model, we're, we've invited the private sector, tribes, uh, labor unions, and organizations that, that represent BIPOC communities to be part of this process because we want a clean energy economy that benefits all regions and, and all communities in the state. So that would be one example. The second major policy issue facing the governor and the legislature is we have the Climate Commitment Act. It will generate funds. How are those funds going to be invested? Uh, Commerce's perspective is to take a sector approach. And so we have a maritime sector and that maritime sector is uh, um, through our uh, innovate, innovative cluster accelerator program has created an organization. Again, public, private research universities, labor unions and companies. And they're looking at how to create a, a blue economy for maritime, a decarbonized uh, port and ocean economy and transportation economy of, of international goods. I agree with uh, Commissioner that in the wood product sector, we could be on the cutting edge with cross-laminated timber, with biochar, with policies that are also both good for, for healthy forests, but also good for new building models. And we need to build a lot more housing, that's clear, to accommodate our population and the population growth that we're anticipating. And if we were doing that in a more intentional, incentivized way for density and transit oriented uh, development in our urban areas, utilizing um, new wood products in, in our rural areas, that would be both uh, more inclusive for everyone, it would create good jobs and it would contribute to our transition. So those are a couple of examples. I think that um, we uh, have that opportunity but it can easily be lost. <clears throat> it can easily be lost to political and economic instability, and and that's why I agree with um, with Amanda that we have to look at the political realities too. How we talk to everyone, how we pull people into these conversations. We at Commerce are proposing um, dramatic outreach to rural areas to bring uh, them into this conversation to use our clean energy fund dollars to invest in innovative projects that are arising from those communities. And I think that it's incumbent upon us to see it as uh, an all, all of Washington solution. And um, that's uh, working together with the, the fellow agencies and, and uh, participants here. I think we can achieve that. Thank you. And you know, as Amanda said earlier, that the State Building Codes Council did pass these wonderful, uh, adopt these uh, uh, regulations. And it's a huge step towards building decarbonization, but you know, getting, for instance, uh, 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 electric heat pumps retrofitted to old homes, that's going to be quite a huge concern for a lot of people because people don't have a lot of money right now with the whole economy the way it is and the, having come through the pandemic. So do you have that on your horizon as are you going to be letting out some wonderful grants and things for people so that we can take advantage of it? Well, keep in mind, the governor's budget will come out in December. The legislature will will be working on that in the next session. And then then commerce, commerce's job will be to distribute those funds as as fairly and efficiently as we can. But we do know and we are putting forward um, frameworks for planning with fellow agencies around electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, I think our work with tribes in siting energy facilities, but also in their own uh, movement forward for energy autonomy as sovereign um, entity, sovereign governments is something we need to be thinking about those partnerships um, rather than simply chasing projects from other um, you know, from major corporations or other states to come into Washington, I think we need intentional strategies that look at each region and what it's and help that region's vision for itself and then help invest in ways to bring that about. Sounds like a good plan to me. Thank you.
Um, so the next question is for Treasurer Pellicciotti. Uh, how is the Washington Treasurer's Department safeguarding our lines of income, our revenue and investments? Well, uh, Nagman, I think you may may have frozen up, but but it's a good place to end the question, which is that you know how, what are we doing to protect our uh, our, our, our revenue and investments. Um, well, that's obviously a core role that our office has at the state treasurer's office. And, you know, I guess I would say a couple things. One is for the last year and a half, um, you know, I've been raising the alarm that I've thought that inflation would not be transitory um, and that we were going to be facing a lot of inflationary pressures here in the state of Washington. And so one of the things that I've done is I've refinanced all of the debt uh, that we have here in the state. Every bit of debt we could legally refinance, we did. We saved $385 million um, that was otherwise going to Wall Street and wasted interest payments that are instead coming back to the state of Washington to meet a lot of future needs, especially as interest rates go up. Um, but also thinking long term, as I was saying earlier, um, what are we doing to recognize the fact that we have, you know, 47% of the births here in the state of Washington are uh, Apple Health funded births. So generally kind of lower income births in terms of Medicaid funded births. And what are we doing to recognize the, the need to adapt um, you know, going forward to make sure that they have the resources necessary to contribute to the economy and contribute to our state treasury and be, uh, be able to reach their full potential. And we've put forward uh, in the state treasurer's office with great partnership with other uh, agencies in government, um, a, a baby bonds Washington future fund, which would essentially be putting money aside, investing it now for the next two decades so that those children have uh, the resources they need two decades from now when they're young adults up to about $25,000 uh, by age 25 for each of those children born through an Apple Health funded birth um, to achieve uh, wealth building tools necessary to really contribute and grow um, and reach their God-given potentials. So we're excited about that. That's an important component as well. And uh, it's one of the things we're doing, looking forward to making sure we're meeting the needs here in the state of Washington. Thank you very much. So the next question is for uh, Commissioner Franz. The Department of Natural Resources has a variety of revenue generating projects, including timber sales, land leases, mining and mineral leases. How is the department engaging with communities that are most impacted by these revenue generating projects? Please share how the department deny, defines impacted communities. And most importantly, how is the department incorporating what you learn from these communities into department policies and procedures? Thank you. Great question. So first I'll define the so impacted communities is a term right now that the Environmental Justice Council will be defining in the next few months based on research and feedback from public testimony and outreach. Um, in practice, as we await their guidance, we're defining it as communities that have determined, um, show, have shouldered a disproportionate burden, whether economic, health or social conditions resulting from environmental harm and risk. And our goal is to make sure we are sharing benefits equally and mitigating harm as much as possible. At the Department of Natural Resources, we're committing to engaging fully with impacted communities throughout the entire state. As for those who don't know, we manage and steward over 6 million acres of land and waters throughout every county of the state that provide critical fish and wildlife habitat, sequester carbon, provide clean air and water, clean energy um, with our wind and solar projects, provide critical food and shelter for our communities, and also provide critical jobs and economic opportunities from forestry and agriculture to seafood, as well as provide funding for education, health, housing, and human services. And in many of our communities, our lands and waters actually make up almost 40% of their entire operating budget. Um, and these are communities where unemployment is between 7 to 12% and funding for government services is extremely limited. So we recognize how important it is that the management of and stewardship of these lands and waters, not just for the short term, but for the long term, are critical to the underlying foundational social economic um, and environmental health of these communities. We also work very, very closely with tribal nations. We have one of the most robust government to government policies that is right now in finalization. We communicate early and often with our tribal nations to ensure we're protecting the critical fish and wildlife habitat and also cultural and archeological resources. One of the things that I'm most proud is the map we are coming out with as we see a gold rush for clean energy and wind and solar throughout our state. We have developers knocking at our doors, uh, <laughs> pushing for us to expand and thanks to the 100% clean energy bill. The problem is, is when we go too fast, 
we can be very um, insensitive and disrespectful to tribal treaty rights, which is paramount. We've now developed a map which actually identifies all the lands that we have that are well suited for wind and solar um, so that we can bring those maps early to the tribes and engage in um, government to government conversation and consultation to make sure we're being respectful to it. In addition, we communicate early and often with our counties, libraries, schools, and junior taxing districts like our fire districts. So they're aware of the revenue sources and the level of funding that we are providing, as well as the critical sort of risks and threat to them, whether it's because of forest health and wildfire, or whether it's because of impacts on fish and wildlife habitat. We also do a very robust engagement with communities that are right there uh, who have their agricultural lands, forest lands, commercial, industrial, and even housing needs, um, where we're bringing forward them community meetings, town halls, and other tools to respond to questions and concerns from communities. Our goal is we're in every community. Uh, our lands are in every community. They're critical for the social, economic, and environmental well-being of that community. And the more we're bringing everyone into that conversation to be part of the solution, the better we all will be. And especially those communities that have been most impacted by decisions of the past. That sounds amazing. Thank you. <laughs> if we can follow through on all of that, that, that really would work well. Dr. Shah, this next question is for you. So the COVID pandemic had a disproportionate impact on our Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. What practices are the Department of Health putting in place to address these disparities? How is Department of Health working with local health jurisdictions to ensure they are addressing disparities in their local communities? How will these practices be applied to the disparities that have already been created by climate change? Yeah, Nagman, thank you for that question. I, I think it's important to just remind everybody that COVID-19 did not start these health inequities uh, in communities across our country and our, our state, uh, but it absolutely unearthed them and accentuated them and made them worse. So I think it's absolutely critical that we remember there's a long-standing history of health inequities in our in our country that we have not had the political will or the collective will to fight to take on, and that is that is a a travesty that we need to continue to address. What COVID did is it exposed it. It showed that if you are in certain communities, you are going to be more likely to have a, an adverse outcome from COVID-19. You're gonna be more likely to be hospitalized. You're gonna be more likely to, to, to receive certain kinds of information. And the misinformation and disinformation that targeted, and I use that word very deliberatively, that targeted communities was also and continues to be a critical piece of this. And in fact, the concern is that much of what, of the vitriol that came during the pandemic has continued and will continue and will be part of our political discourse course for a long time coming. That is probably even more concerning than anything else that, that we have seen. In other words, the future may be worse in many ways when it comes to misinformation and disinformation. So that is something that all of us need to be really thinking about. So what are we doing at Department of Health? Well, you know, I, I obviously don't want to put the the transformation plan back up because obviously I couldn't show it. Uh, but also I want to I want to really just say that you know we continue as we have fought this pandemic, we have uh, had two aspects of this that are critical, that there is um, absolutely our response overall to all communities, no matter who you are, where you live, and, and or, or what you look like in the state of Washington, you should have access to optimal health opportunities. That is number one. Number two is that we also believe that there are many communities that have been left behind. And we have to accentuate our focus on those very communities. And so that means, for example, during the vaccine process, we had put in place a vaccine collaborative that was very much about bringing 700 community organizations and entities together to talk about vaccines and what we needed to do to champion vaccines. Well, guess what? Instead of just stopping at that, at that point in the pandemic, we have continued to leverage that. For example, for monkeypox, the MPV response, we took that same collaborative and we said, 
please help us in me and in, in reaching communities that have been again impacted by this sec this new disease. This is an example of leveraging the collective capacities that have been built during the pandemic, but we have to continue to invest in public health. The final thing that I would say is that there is our our state is should be so proud of the the the, the governor and the legislative process that have put together foundational public health services. This is this several year back before I even came to the state of Washington, other states across the country look at our investment in health and to the governmental public health system. So we have funded recently over nine positions, 10 positions in local health departments, as well as a couple of positions at Department of Health to coordinate on climate and health. And this is includes a climate justice coordinator within our agency that coordinates not just at the state level, but also across these local health jurisdictions, because we believe ultimately that it's going to take a bottoms up approach, as well as a top down, as well as an all of us. I think Lisa said all of law, all of Washington approach. That's what it's really going to take for us to be able to fight climate and health and the disparities and inequities that certain communities have seen, not just during this pandemic, but well beyond this pandemic. Thank you for that. Amanda, I have a quick question for you. It's a little long, but you know, just bear with me. So we found that cultural values had become central to climate change attitudes, with those holding closed attitudes being less likely to be concerned about climate change and to support actions to address it than those holding open attitudes. Nevertheless, most people across the value spectrum still supported climate action. But are people across the value spectrum concerned about climate change for the same reasons? Are they more concerned about today's weather or their grandchildren's future? Do they care about green jobs or local habitats? Are they concerned about the cost to themselves or the world's poorest countries? And do they trust governments at home and abroad to follow through on their climate commitments? Thank you. Um, you know, the first part of this question, when we talk about you know, the, the spectrum of um, values that people can fall on. There's those big five personality traits, openness and conscientiousness and extroversion, so on. So I think on that scale of openness, you know, when people are, um, their values lean more open, you, we've seen that they support more um, climate change policy. But as you've said, more and more, um, it doesn't, you know, there's there's different motivators for why people value um, climate change uh, resiliency or climate change policy. And and so I, I think you're right that people are not motivated by the same thing. You know, is it is it thinking of the, the future of your grandkids or is it thinking about your family's bottom line right now? Is, is, is that why, um, you know, what's your motivator? And, you know, as Lisa has mentioned there, we need to, to um, really take into account all of the different value systems that are held by Washingtonians, um, including people that live in rural communities. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that everybody values and wants clean air and clean soil and clean water and the severity of wildfires that we've seen, you know, everyone can agree that that we want to manage our forests so that we can avoid um, that kind of severity. But there's so many different ways that, that we can respond to that type of management. I mean, listening to um, environmental science and, and following those policies for thinning on the east side um, versus the west side of the Cascades is one thing. But um, from, from a a smaller level, I think there's lots that we can do investing in our rural economies and in local jobs to retrofit homes with metal roofs that are fireproof, that protect people that to live in that community. That can be installed in conjunction with solar panels by local companies. Um, I just spoke to someone this morning who said that their you know, solar panels now are providing their full energy for their home and their transportation. Um, and it's coming at no cost to them. So if we can, I think everyone would get on board with um, no cost transportation and, and home energy if we provide them with those solutions, um, you know, in, in, in local ways. 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I know it was more of a, it was, it, it, well, okay. We'll, what we're gonna do now is we're running behind by about five minutes because the conversations have been so interesting. And I really wanted people to finish their thoughts. Um, I am going to throw this question out for everybody. And I am just going to ask that you put in your uh, worth, whatever your, you value uh, around that. And then take maybe two minutes each if, if you need to, or if you don't want to respond at all, that's up to you. But the question that I'm going to uh, throw out there for, for all of you to respond to is, how are our your agencies working together to create a climate resilient Washington State. I'll just add what uh, Mr. Franz already referred to. The Environmental Justice Council is a is a multi agency and multi community approach uh, to working together. Uh, Commerce is also working with multiple agencies on this clean energy siting issue that was referred to, and on um, mapping and planning for. Uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure and on uh, resiliency in our energy system and emergency management for, for both climate and cybersecurity threats to our to our energy infrastructure. And, and what I what I would add is, you know, we we know that our our governor is, has an advocate, a strong believer in climate. Uh, climate and health, climate and well-being, climate and protection. I think it's so critical. I mean, you know, obviously, even this week he has been at the COP27 to really talk about what are the, the the important ways of looking at our climate commitments. And I think what we're doing is to be part of the the discussion of what can we do it as agencies. Some of it is really awareness, and some of it is action. So action includes developing our environmental health disparities maps with other agencies, community groups that adds climate indicators to our, our, our even understanding of the system so we can then move forward with, with responding. But it also means that we have to really be thinking about collaborating with our agencies during the, the blue sky, but also during emergencies. And that is so critical because we know climate disasters, climate impacted uh, concerns related to flooding or heat or smoke or wildfire, et cetera, these continue to really impact our state. And we've got to make sure we continue to work as state agencies to be able to take those on. I'll, I'll just go and unfortunately I have to drop off by 1130. So um, no, so at Department of Natural Resources, we very much feel like we're on the front lines of the rapidly changing climate, whether it's wildfires, whether it's dying forests, whether it's increased drought, uh, that's impacting the 1 million acres of agricultural land we manage and dust storms that we've also begun to see or ocean acidification and sea level rise that is impacting the 2.6 million acres of aquatic lands that we manage. Um, specifically for that, we've developed a climate resilience plan. We went out and did a full assessment of the 6 million acres of land that are in every county of our state that represent every type of land in Washington state. And we've developed a climate resilience plan that we are now working to implement. We have a climate resilience officer at our agency, one of the first ever. Um, and specifically, then we're used going and working. We're working with Department of Agriculture on our agricultural management of our lands, expanding sustainable agriculture protection, bringing more agriculture within public ownership, making sure that the water rights we have are actually protected and preserved, while also increasing the number of water rights held within public ownership as we see a privatization and buying off of water rights from people, investors outside of the state. We're also working with Department of Ecology in the context of drought and how do we actually set ourselves up to be more resilient um, through the kinds of protections that need to be placed. Um, and we got funding in this last legislative cycle to begin to do that work as we're seeing increased um, reduction in water supply. We also have created uh, community resilience officers in some of our highest risk climate um, risk areas. Um, where we are working at the local level with fire districts, local city council and um, county commissioners, as well as community based organizations to help make all of our homes wildfire resilient, but also the other elements around full climate resiliency. 
Um, in addition to that, we've been working in the context of our urban areas. And I think this is really important because we very much are focused on the impacts around climate change in our rural areas because they, it feels very front and center. But none of us should forget the heat dome that was experienced just a few years back where we tragically 100, more than 100 people's lives were lost in Washington state. I oversee the urban forestry program. It's an area that has really not been, had much investment in it. Um, and it's where we need to have even more investment as we see hotter temperatures. Uh, the fact is in parts of Seattle, for example, there's a 13 degree temperature difference between a community color, low income community and a largely white affluent community. We've been um, increasing the investments thanks to um, the work we've done with the legislature. And I know Department of Commerce is that we look at land use and growth management act and our partnership with you there. We've been able to significantly increase um, by 700% more money to 300% more organizations um, just in the last year alone. Um, and that will only increase as we now secure investments at the federal level to bring to more of our urban areas east and west of the mountains uh, so that we can actually truly change the disparities which are really impacting um, communities that largely have been forgotten and abandoned. Amanda, did you have anything to add? I do, yeah, thanks, Nagamata. You knew you knew I wanted to jump in. Um, I um, am so glad that Commissioner Franz mentioned the urban forest because um, that is something, that's one of the ways that the Lands Council has been working with DNR. We're actually the um, first organization, I think, that has received a grant from DNR four years in a row for the, our urban forestry work. Um, and we're, we're so happy to continue working with DNR. I, in fact, am going to Seattle tonight and will be speaking at a conference on um, community forestry in Seattle to talk about the Lands Council and the City of Spokane's Spokanopy program um, that's in part funded by DNR. And that's an effort to increase Spokane's urban forest. Um, the Lands Council participated um, with Gonzaga University this past summer. Um, Gonzaga conducted a study through a NOAA grant and we were able to uh, look at temperatures here in Spokane during a heat dome and saw that same 13 degree temperature difference actually in, in Spokane neighborhoods. And so we know that um, planting trees is is the only way to cool temperatures down without using more energy, right? Um, and 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 in fact, it can add um, carbon sequestration and be and become a carbon sink. So, the Lands Council will be celebrating our 40th year anniversary next year, and I'm I'm so proud um, to work at a nonprofit that is a regional nonprofit and and remains. Um, this strong institution in our community. And I just say that we, um, as a regional nonprofit, that is what I think our role is, is to work with all of these agencies and, and, to, and to be a conduit um, for you know, that information that's happening at a high level and bring that to our communities and incubate good ideas on the ground. We've had a grant with the Department of Commerce to look at um, biochar production, which is another way of um, sequestering carbon and dealing with um, uh, forestry and agriculture, organic waste um, that could otherwise be fuel loads and turning it into something productive. Um, so I, I'm, ha I'm happy to see that many of these agencies are working with the Lands Council and other groups like us on the ground. But we're, as you said, just a small staff of eight. So there's lots of work to be done. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. So I have got a couple of questions here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah, for sharing that link. When we send out the link for this for the recording, we'll add that at, at that time as well, so that you know people who weren't here are interested in seeing what was going on. They will and have Nagana, that. I believe that the the um, transformational plan has there's a link that's been dropped in the Q and A that yes, participants so might be able to see. So. Right, so they can see, and then we'll add that to our, our uh, email when we send out the recording as well. 
All right, so there's a couple of questions here. And what it says is, there's one that, that says, if we focus our energies on growing more food locally, keeping it in state, uh, keeping it in state, increasing support for our rural communities and teaching our next generation of food producers, as well as improving our local food systems in general, could that make an impact with regards to both climate crisis as well as build a bridge between rural urban interests? I mean, I'll start. I mean, I will just say the most sustainable thing we can do, right, in Washington State is grow the wood products that we depend on, that provide the shelter for our homes, provide the hospitals, the schools, right? Because it makes sure that we keep our forests local, the jobs are local, we make sure we keep more of our land in forestry. And the same is true with agriculture. The reality is the more we're growing our foods locally right here, the more we're gonna make sure we have food sources not just for this generation, but future generations. We're going to make sure that we actually keep our farmland with ones lost. You can't really recover them again. That's why it's such a high value natural resources. It's going to make sure we have the water resources we need. We're going to be able to put the sustainable agricultural practices in place a lot to ensure the long-term health of those soils for production, to make sure we have enough soils in production um, and they're not getting paved over and turned into subdivisions and housing developments and commercial and industrial and it's going to make sure we have the water resources right because we will have it front and center we'll understand its critical importance for our environment our critical importance for our health and well-being not just this generation but future and we'll also have the economic component there of how it's providing that critical job source in our rural communities as well as our urban communities i mean it's one of the reasons we've been trying to um, increase our agricultural production um, and actually make sure that lands we had that were fallow that could be high value at feeding of our communities, not just in food source, but also wine and all those other things we appreciate here in Washington State, that we're keeping it in ag production. One of the great things is when we do that, we actually now create a value for it that the private sector is less likely to convert into housing development, and they themselves will start to be investing in ag production. So we have private and public lands working together for the long-term insurance of a strong, healthy agricultural economy, but a strong, healthy society where local foods are available along with our local water sources. And we're at Commerce, we're looking at the same thing uh, the next sector lead that I'd like to bring on is, would be in the maker economy, and that's in in food as well as as craft brews and things that we that are already flourishing. But we need intentionality in that in that land and also in the capital, so that um, immigrant communities and um, communities of color can have access to that land and those entrepreneurship resources to be successful. Um, and so that's a new focus of ours. And I just have to put in a plug here. We have a lot of job openings and you can work at Commerce from anywhere in the state. So take a look at our website and uh, we're looking for uh, forest products and innovative ag sector lead right now and um, many other uh, positions as well. And I do believe that um, that is an important part of a sustainable future. Uh, and so we are also partnering with the Department of Agriculture on these initiatives and see that as a really key, a key part of, of what we'd like to, to see in the future. Can I, can I yes, add one? Can I add one thing just because I'm going to have to jump off early, unfortunately, but I think this is a great opportunity where government can actually sort of lead with a big, very significant goal, which says we want by X date, we're going to have X amount of our food production, right, that meets our growing population to be provided by Washington State, right? I mean, and in doing that, then the economy comes along with it, as well as the land stewards and the land managers, as well as a commitment by the larger public to that important component of growing food locally. We've seen a similar example in the context of forestry. So for example, when we went and said we were going to now restore 1.25 million acres of forest in Eastern Washington alone through forest health treatment so that they don't go up in smoke and flames, 
It sent a message to the economy that if you're interested in cross laminate timber and mass timber, one of the most sustainable, affordable building products, then come invest in Washington State. Within a year and a half of that goal and the development of that plan, we had two facilities in Eastern Washington, as you know, one in Spokane and one in Colville, that were actually broke grand, ground and actually building product and creating jobs within our rural areas, right? And now it's it's actually developing housing, which we're about to do hopefully very shortly on our public lands in our urban areas so we can get that full circular economy from the forest to the product to the housing that our communities need. Um, so I think there's a great opportunity for that sort of private sector, local community partnership when we set those big goals and government works closely with our communities to make it happen. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, Commissioner Franz, and whenever you're here in Spokane next, please come and see us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. Okay. Um, I wanted to see if okay. I could just jump in and say a little more on the, the question of, you know, if we focus on um, farming and, and local food production, um, I, I do think that that, you know, can, can solve some things, but then the question becomes, um, do people want to farm? Is is that is that a good job? What is the what is the bottom line um, of someone you know making their living from from growing food and from from agriculture? Because what we're seeing is uh, is you know the younger generation not really wanting to take that on for whatever reason, and that's part of why we're seeing you know farms being converted. And so while I think that 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 could be part of the solution to focus on um, local food production and to set a big goal, you know, of having Washington State, you know, produce X amount of food locally. Um, but but then, you know, what are what is the infrastructure that we've provided in rural communities for, you know, like we talked about electric vehicles for healthcare centers, um, it, it, those kinds of things I think need to be taken into consideration. Not to mention that agriculture does often have. Um, uh, deterious effects on water quality um, if, if we're not really careful with that. So it's a tricky question. Um, we have one here from Aruna Bhuta. She says, do we need more charging stations to help people convert heating home to heat pump and solar? Whether we need more charging stations or do we need to help people convert heating their home with heat pumps and solar panels? Where should we be spending our money? I'm not sure. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure I'm I'm the the right person to answer this question, but I'll I'll jump in and and just say that um, I I don't know if these are either ors. Uh, the these uh, really ultimately are yes, we have to make decision trade offs, and everything has an opportunity cost, and there is a reason. If you do one thing, it's going to have an impact on something else. You don't have enough resources to do something else. But I but I do think that when we're thinking about the choices that we're making and the policy decisions that are that are at hand, that we we do need to be thinking about a robust, comprehensive way to invest, and and so it it does it does um, it, it does beg the question: wherever we can have dual use, wherever we can have one opportunity that helps us support another opportunity, I think that's a better way to approach things. And so I, I always get concerned when we do something versus something else, because it it then it, it, it almost inherently puts a conflict of those two issues or values when ultimately there, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of um, uh, resource deployment that can be made in, in both areas, depending on what we really truly are trying to achieve. And so then I'll turn it to my colleague experts, uh, Amanda, Lisa, and Mike, you know, because they'll have more on this. But this might, I always, I, I have this, this visceral either or where I feel like there are opportunities for us to be thinking about a, a more um, leveraged approach that allows us to, to build capacity in a broader, broader manner. Thank you. Making sure that charging infrastructure is deployed in a way that it can be utilized no matter where you live in the state. So not just along the I-5 corridor, but going east-west as well and in rural communities is, is really important. And we, we are working with tribes that want charging infrastructure. 
uh, also on their lands. So I think that that is that is a significant effort that needs to take place. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as both in the new built environment, uh, creating as much energy efficiency and um, uh, clean energy uh, infrastructure for that new built environment is really important. And then at the same time, as we, for example, utilize our federal funds for low income um, heat and energy assistance program, the LIHEAT heat program, we also have weatherization programs and uh, we rely on a network of community action agencies around the state to partner with us on those weatherization programs and weatherization plus health, um, which is a, a special focus on uh, in, improving people's uh, indoor air quality at the same time as uh, improving the energy efficiency. So I agree, these are not either or questions. It's um, mobilizing the resources, but also making sure that they're e equitably distributed and that um, all communities have access to them and under and we have community partners that are trusted voices in their communities to help us um, make sure that people are actually receiving the resources that, that they are qualified to receive. I'd just add um, that, you know, I, I think that it's not an, an either or, and I'm, and I'm glad to hear that that's been a, a bigger part of the discussion because by definition resiliency um you know is achieved when there's a diversity of ways of meeting a core function right so we need you know as many ways as possible um, to be employed if we're going to reach um you know net zero or um safeguard our quality of lives in the future so um i I'm I'm just glad to hear that that we agree that there needs to be many ways to achieve this, and that when something can can overlap and accomplish two things at once, um, I think we should be prioritizing those things. When we talk about how we as a whole society are going to adapt to climate change, I think the the, the rate of change is going to be so swift in the coming decades that um, it's going to be something that a lot of us are not accustomed to. And so I think we can look to nature for, for some answers. And we see in nature um, where are examples when changes are made quickly, when adaptations are made quickly, and it's when things evolve together, when things are mutually um, co-evolving, when flowers and insects, that kind of thing. Um, that's when we see adaptation really speed up in nature and and we as a society are going to have to speed up our own adaptations um and so it so it makes sense that we would work together on that you know the, the only thing i might add too is just it shows how important the investment is in these areas to create the economies of scale necessary for the type of development that i think we all want to see I mean, as part of why it's a good investment in these areas is because as we're pointing out we see this as an inevitability but it's important that that investment come in order to create the economies of scale so you can expand and develop a lot of these efforts in a more efficient way to allow for the type of expansion that I think we're, we're then expecting to see. It's obviously circular, but you want it to be moving in a direction that obviously is working uh, toward the goals that we, we want to see happen. And, and the issue that Amanda bro brought up already about workforce is really, really significant because uh, associated with the new technologies and with the transformation are new jobs, but there's also the question of, the, is the workforce being prepared to take them and are, are young people interested in them? What can we do to help uh, make it um, uh, known about what the jobs are what the, and what the uh, education and training opportunities are? So whether that's apprenticeships, or in some, or um, reaching out to young people at an early age to understand what some of these opportunities are. I uh, remember being in um, uh, Vagan Timber up in Northeast, looking at some of the technologies being deployed there, and my internalized vision of what happened in a wood products manufacturing facility was a lot of heavy lifting, and instead, it's um, it's machines and technology and being able to 
have the skills to utilize those technologies, which could be very appealing uh, to, uh, to young people if they knew that that was an option. So I think we have to also think about these workforce. And I want to just do a shout out to the Lands Council because I know you work with high school students and, um, and you work with schools and you're, br and you're bringing these things into classrooms and you're bringing young people in to help plant trees uh, along the banks of the river. And so just a big shout out to the Lands Council for the work that you do in this area of education and bringing young people into the work. Thank you so much. So one of the questions that was asked was, uh, what are you doing, if anything, regarding free energy technology developed almost 80 years ago by Tesla? Others, like former CIA director William Colby, invested in a free energy device and then died in a boat accident. Currently, Emery Smith also had also developed a small energy device that could be used by anyone anywhere. He was almost killed more than once and has been threatened not to share this technology. Does anyone have any insight? In Sorry, that? I don't have background to answer that question. I will say that our Clean Energy Fund uh, takes applications from all across the state and utilities, um, uh, research universities, uh, et cetera. Uh, communities um, give us um, projects, innovative projects and plans and sometimes pilot projects uh, like that we can uh, invest some public funds in. And again, that doesn't um, mean that they're necessarily going to scale. Uh, as Treasurer said, that's something that needs to happen with further investments, but sometimes we can help with the proof of concept either for the technology or for the market application that can then lead to those kinds of investment funds that can help scale. Uh, what I would just add is, and I, I think both uh, uh, our way of looking at the world has evolved and challenges and, and concerns and emergencies have certainly evolved and certainly our thinking and our approaches and our, our solutions have evolved. And I think both both um, um, Treasurer and, and uh, Commerce Secretary have made a very cogent argument for the importance of investment. So oftentimes we look at investment as being, you know, they're, they're dollars on a spreadsheet. And so it's very easy to look at the dollars and say, well, it's just a cost. But if your cost is actually giving you something in return, which we call ROI, return on investment, there is something that is coming back that is multitude fold factor of, of a multiplicative or other type of approach that allows you to actually grow and, and improve and enhance the future, then it's not just a dollar or a number on a spreadsheet, it becomes an investment. And we've got to be smarter about our investments because oftentimes, unfortunately, we do look at them as, as, as just numbers. And we have to really be thinking about where is it going to truly improve and enhance our, our efficiencies, our effectiveness, and certainly our energy. So the three E's, efficiencies, effectiveness, and energy, uh, or energies. And I think that is really critical as we try to move our work forward. Thank you. So that's all we have time for. I uh, just wanted to say thank you uh, to all who submitted questions and helped us bring issues to light. We are grateful for the panelists' time and for their teams who made this panel possible and worked with us over the last five months to bring this project to fruition. Thanks are due also to my wonderful colleagues and our allies, like-minded individuals and organizations who helped us spread the word. We had almost 300 people log in from across the state to hear from our wonderful panelists. The link in the recording will be emailed in the next few days. I would like to draw your attention to our next event, which will take place at Saturday Commons on Thursday, November 17, 2022, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., titled Campfire Stories, Tales from Our Public Lands. The Lands Council, along with our community partners, is hosting a public land storytelling series. Our first event will be this Thursday, as I said, 6 to 9 at the Saranac, and we'll focus around epics in our public lands to epic in climbing usually means something has not gone to plan, but it could be an epic fishing trip, an epic wildlands adventure, or 
um, it could maybe be an epic journey to learn a new outdoor activity. Details about this and other events are listed on our website, landscouncil.org. Thank you for being here, everybody, and for supporting our work. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thanks. And thanks to all of our participants, all of our attendees. You. you guys were awesome. Just awesome. Yeah. Okay. Let's see.